Hello and welcome into episode 13 of the Stomp the Bus podcast. Uh, this is your host, Mark Harris, coming at you. Um, and got a few things to talk about, just a solo show today. Uh, so yeah, we'll get started. Look, terrible, b- bad game against Utah on Saturday. Um, look, 24 to 6 at half. Didn't. Offensive line really struggled. Jones was sacked five times. He didn't have a particularly great game either, throwing two picks. And, you know, I mean, this is kind of what you expected in this game. Maybe not quite as big of a margin. I mean, I was I was hoping you could lose like a 34-24 type of game where you're kind of within the 10-point striking distance but never actually within – your shot of actually winning the game. Uh, that did not happen. Utah went out to a quick, quick 14-0 lead. They hit us with the hit us with the flea flicker, and I was in the upper deck watching that. You could see it develop. Um, they had guys wide open on that, and obviously they scored a touchdown there. Uh so and then they had another fourth down pass. Um that was actually a pretty good play by Ken Sade from Utah to make the catch. So if you want to be the super optimist and say, hey, you know, you got hit with a trick play and and they made a great catch on fourth down to get up early, you could say that. But Utah was moving the ball super well. Um, I mean, they were up 24 to 6 at halftime. Like, we can parse – here and there but it it showed just how big the gap these the between asu and utah is right now um and you know it was less than a year ago less than a year ago asu was up 21 to 7 at halftime in salt lake city and since then it's just all gone to shit so in less than a year that's how far um asu has dropped off come to to where utah is so You know, it was just reality slapping in your face. And, um, you know, there's not really too much to say about the game. You know, there wasn't any, like, obvious – it's hard to judge Iguano um, on, like, tactical things he did because the game was just out of hand so quickly. Um, And, you know, we have USC coming up. Not going to be a whole lot of – super in-depth analysis of that game. I think it's probably going to go fairly similar to the Utah game. Maybe the score will be a bit different. Maybe it'll be more of like a, I don't know, 45 to 20 USC over ASU. I feel like that. I could see that happening, something like that. I don't think, I know that USC's defense only held, only uh, gave up 14 points to Oregon State, but still not totally sold in on that defense. And on the flip side, I know, USC's offense only scored 17 points against Oregon State, but I'm also not convinced that we can hold them to a point total like that in the Coliseum. So it's going to be another tough game coming up. Um, After the game of Guano, he mentioned, um, thank the fans for showing up and sticking by the team. I felt like I saw – I think it was super West sports on Twitter. Um, they had all the, they had all the, the top, I think it was the home games of this past weekend. And each team had a percentage of um, percentage of attendees at the game based on their actual stadium size. Uh, so for example, Oregon state had 109% of their stadium size, but that's also because, stage be remodeled and so they fit more people in than they otherwise would have for a normal game this season but ASU had said they're at like 75 percent it definitely wasn't that it, it was like 50 50 um maybe like 60 60 40 in terms of filled seats there's a lot of Utah fans there too so not a com- complete embarrassment of a showing like UCLA but also not great and I mean if you're a fan I'm not going to blame you for not going to these games um you know they're one and three right now we said when we said after the Eastern Michigan game, they're looking one and five right in the face. And that face is getting closer and closer because UW doesn't look any worse. I know the only saving grace ASU has of winning the UW game 
uh, on October 8th, I believe it is. Uh, that's going to be a home game at Sun Devil Stadium. So if it's like, if you maybe get 100 degrees that day, you get it in the upper 90s. Um, as someone who grew up in Washington, that's a big uh, differentiator from early October <laughs> temperatures there. So that could be maybe it'll get them a little shock to the system, but I just I don't see how ASU is stopping that offense. Um, so anyway, that's looking a little bit too far ahead. But, you know, in this last game, just looking at some of the stats. Emory Jones, and here's the thing that just really stands out, is like ASU had 20 rushing attempts for a total of six yards, and that just – they're not going to win like that. You know, Valade had 30 yards rushing, and Gata only had one carry for two yards, but Emory Jones, 11 carries for 26 – for negative 26 yards. Some of that's sacks. So college football, I remember the sack the, – the minus yards from sacks – come out of the rushing total, which I think is kind of stupid, but that's just me. I guess one bright spot, uh, Elijah Badger continues to show why he was a such a high recruit. They're getting him more involved in the offense. And, I mean, look, with ASU this year, that's kind of the things we got to look for. You got to look for the guys that are playing well um, in spite of the team not playing well, you know. what Another – not great game for the defense. They gave up 205 yards on the ground and 260 through the air. So you got, you talk, you just kind of do whatever they want. Um, you know, just, we got, we got, we got beat pretty bad and it's going to be a few more of those this year. You would hope, I honestly, at this point, I don't, it seems so unlikely that ASU comes out of these next two games, even going one and one and going into the bye at two and four. I just think they are, really looking at one and five in the face. It just depends. How do you get to that one and five? You know, what I'm looking for is games like they played against Oklahoma state, just be in the game late third quarter at some point. And then whatever happens, they score two touchdowns. You can't keep up fine, but just go into halftime. And it's like, Oh, we're only down by 10 points. You know, Hey, we can, we, we, we've all done this as fans. You think, oh, okay, well we can score, right? Uh, you know, start the third quarter, get a stop, get a field goal. We're back in the game, you know, whatever. You, that's what you do as a fan. You think of ways your teams can um, get back in it. So I'm I'm hoping for kind of results like that in these next two games where, yeah, you're, you're almost certainly not going to beat USC or Washington. Um, you know, crazy things happen in college football. So, you know, the uh, last or two weeks ago, Kansas State lost at home to Tulane, and then last week they beat Oklahoma on the road. So nothing – I don't want to say nothing, but weird things happen in college football. So who knows? Maybe ASU gets something together. But uh, that's really just wishful thinking for my, my end. So, uh, yeah. I mean, if you watch the game, you saw what happened. Uh, good for Messiah Swenson for getting his first touchdown catch of the season. I think he's I think he's one of those guys that like he I I I'm looking for him to shine in spite of maybe others on the team not shining as much. So um good games from Badger and uh Swenson. He, Swenson only had one catch, but first touchdown of the season. Um as far as Emory Jones, definitely not a good game. Struggle with the blitz. Um they they need to find ways to get him. Um running i mean he ran for like 750 yards last year in the sec and i know utah is a good team oklahoma state's a good team but we weren't doing this against eastern michigan either you know and so we saw a little bit of it against nau but you can't just you know slice and dice nau on the ground and be like okay we're good no like it's got to be better than this and so who knows maybe usc there's an opportunity to get the ground game going and you hit some big plays off that. That's kind of the only way you can talk yourself into it. Maybe Caleb Williams give you some turnovers, but that's, again, this is just really like stretching, stretching reality thin. So, you know, I, I think that this, this just where we're at in the schedule just really hurts this team because if, 
the schedule just happened to open. Like if we had UCLA at home last week and then going on the road to play Colorado, I think there's a very different way that you can kind of get into Pac-12 play. Because I don't think we would have beaten UCLA, but I think that that's a much more like we can compete with them than Utah, you know. And then I think we're, I mean, we're, we're better than Colorado. That's the only team I can really confidently say that about. But yeah, so after this game, uh, I'm sorry, after Washington, they have, and then after the buys, well, you get at Stanford, at Colorado, home for UCLA. You know, that's not some terrible stretch even for this team. So if it, if you're looking for wins, it's probably going to be after the bye, which is tough because that's, you know, three weeks away. So, you know, this is kind of what we all thought. That, let me rephrase it. We, not everyone thought this season would necessarily go like this. I am on record picking them to go six and six. Um, and ASU losing to Eastern Michigan uh, ended that possibility, but it, as we were making predictions, you know, before the season, some people predicted they'd be terrible, others, you know, seven and five, whatever, stuff like that. But um, we all knew in the back of our head, like, this could totally go wrong. And so far, you know, you get have a coach fired after week three, um, get blown out the next week. It's looking like it's on that path. So it could be a long season. Um, we'll, you know, come at, come, come at you once a week um, with videos, podcasts, and really the same thing for, for our purposes. But yeah, so tough game against Utah. And I mean, the thing is like, you, 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 you rush for six yards and you allow them to rush for 205 yards. Like you don't need to be a football, a football guy to know that that's just, huge issues on the offensive and defensive line um, if that's happening. So and the defensive line was supposed to be one of the, I don't want to say better groups, but just like a group that you weren't necessarily worried about. Like you were uh, with the secondary or the offensive line for that matter. Offensive line has a lot of transfers in um, and experienced guys. So you can see why the offensive line is not, doing that well um you know honestly like i'm looking at these next two if, if if they do win one of these games like that would be such a big boon for the program just because particularly usc because then if you beat usc then that'll attract more people to go to the washington game even if they lose but that'll just be such a big like oh my gosh like we this team can actually do something type of moment you know because their only win right now is against nau so yeah um, but I would not pick them. I would not bet them. I know it's a big line. Don't, I would not touch them against USC. It's just, it's tough to trust this team. I hope Aguano does a good job for the rest of the year. And, you know, who knows, maybe he'll be elevated to the full-time head coach. Um, personally, I, I don't think we got into this last week, but just personally for myself, I like Aguano, but I also don't want to get caught in the trap of just keeping the interim head coach going into the next year, just based off vibes for lack of a better word, you know, um, I know he's a good guy. I know he's a program builder and I know he has connections to the Valley. So like people drawing the line of him becoming the head coach isn't crazy because of all those things I just mentioned, but that doesn't mean he's necessarily the right guy to be the head coach. I mean, you're the largest school in the state. You're one of the largest schools in the country. And you're trying to get back to relevance as a football program. I mean, right now you're pretty much a punchline. Um, and you're kind of lucky that like Colorado exists and Nebraska exists and, you know, Georgia Tech just fired their head coach. Like you're kind of lucky these, uh, these other things are going on in the national college football landscape because like when people said it was a tire fire, like – Maybe the vibes are good in the building and stuff, but just in terms of on the field results and exterior people looking in and saying, hey, this isn't going to go well, like so far they're right, you know, and hopefully the guys on the team um, respond to that. But anyway, uh, regarding the guano, I just I just don't want him to get the job because people are like, oh, he's an Arizona guy. He knows knows what it's like to be a Sun Devil, which doesn't mean anything when I hear that. 
Um, just hire the best guy. And I don't think it's this, I also don't think it's this foregone conclusion that if you hire someone else, then Iguano is just 100% going to leave. Um, I, I mean, he could, I don't know, but there are a lot of examples of coaches being elevated to the interim head coach, the team hires someone else, and then the, the interim head coach remains. In fact, I'm pretty sure that's uh, exactly what happened with Texas Tech last year. I'm checking. Um, no, I'm wrong. Okay, so... <laughs> uh, yeah, so Sonny Cumbie was the interim head coach at Texas Tech, and now he's the head coach at Louisiana Tech. So never mind. I was wrong about that. But I also, like, there are examples of guys who go back um, to being just a position coach or something. And if – I just don't – and even if you do lose a guano because you don't promote him to be the head coach after this, uh, it's not, like, the worst loss in the world, you know. I mean, there are a lot of – talented coaches out there. Um, and I, and I, I, I like Iguano. Like if he does end up being the head coach, that would be a very good thing because that means that he's in these next, you know, eight games really done something. I mean, he would have to go or one and three. Now you have to go five and three to get to six and six. That seems, uh, I don't, it's hard to say that's doable, but it doesn't, no oh, man, that that seems so hard to, hard to envision them going six and six from here, and so for him to actually be the head coach, he would need to at least go five and three, and probably better. And if you go six and two in these next eight games, that probably means you're beating one of these next two opponents. Um, and if you don't beat one of these next two opponents, you go you start one and five, and then rattle off six wins. Then that's also gonna be like, oh, okay, well maybe you didn't do good against the best of the best, but you beat all the other middling Pac-12 teams. So maybe that, that how it works. And again, we did mention on previous shows, like I'm not even saying this because Iguano is a high school coach. And I don't think he can do it at the next level. That's not what I'm saying because there's not one path to become a good college football coach. There's so many different ways people get in. You see examples of like internal hires. Like I think that's what Dabo was. Uh, Ryan Day at Ohio State. Um, and then you see, you know, guys come in from other programs like Kirby Smart going to Georgia, uh, Nick Saban coming back from the NFL, um, Chris Peterson going from Boise to Washington and so on and so on. So there's not one way um, to get the next coach per se. But I, I just don't want people to be like, oh, we should keep Aguano because he's an Arizona guy. And he, you know, the program has good vibes and all this stuff. And it's like, okay, like we know we need to win games. Like, so anyway, that's kind of my thoughts on that. Like I, I just heard some people just getting a little bit too far on the, uh, the hype train for Iguano because of all these things that it could be. Um, and because, you know, he's going to, you know, recruit at Arizona games. What a concept. I know. I mean, what a freaking concept. You go to a Saguaro game to recruit some kids. So uh, who knows how it'll work out, but, and I wish him the best. I don't have anything against him. I just don't think that as ASU fans, we should just be like, Oh, yep. We, 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 we got our guy. We don't even need to look for a coach in the coaching search. I mean, he's got the vibes. He's a good coach. You can, he did it at the high school level. It's like, no, just let's just see how it all plays out. Um, and not just, figuratively uh, go with the first partner that looks at you, you know, <laughs> like, let's just take a deep breath. It's going to be a long season and we'll see how Guano does. Um, I just, it's going to be very difficult for him to end up being the long-term head coach because this team just isn't that good. And so they're probably not going to win enough games for it to even be a discussion down the road. I mean, after this, after losing to Eastern Michigan, it just four and eight just feels really Four and eight, three and nine feels like where this team's going to end up. You know, I think they beat Colorado and then I think they can beat Stanford and I think they can beat U of A just because U of A's defense is awful. I, I think U of A's defense is even worse than ASU's defense um, because, I mean, they let Cal, Cal 
one of the worst offensive teams score like 50 points last weekend. And so, and they don't have, they don't have the personnel to just quickly correct it. They have the personnel to incrementally improve it. And by the end of the year, they, their defense might be better than ASU's, but at, as it stands right now, I think ASU's more defense is a little better. Um, not that they're great, but anyway, uh, we have a few more things to touch on. Speaking of ASU's defense, uh, this is not a good thing per se, because um, the Markham twins, Keon and Kawan Markham, have been away from the football team pretty much since the coaching change. So, and they're they're gone for personal reasons. And Iguano, I'm looking at this on Arizona Sports 98.7 FM. Um, he, he's quoted in here saying, quote, it's a personal situation that I'm going to keep them away from the team for right now. Iguano said on Monday, but quote, it's just personal for both of them. I think it's hard for them in regard to the coaching change. We've been talking, however, so understandable for these two kids. Uh, they're from Long Beach Poly, so recruited by Pierce, assumingly. And so they probably have a big connection to the past staff, which makes sense. Um, this is something that happens with coaching changes. Not everyone's going to be fully on board, and I don't really blame them. So if this is the last we've seen of Keon and Kawan Markman Sun Devil jerseys, uh, you know, no hard feelings from me. It's just part of the business, so to speak. And I can't blame them for wanting to leave. I understand why they would consider something else. I mean, this is not a perfect situation right now. And the coach that they went to play for got fired three games into the season. I just, I'm not going to get mad at them for not being a Sun Devil, not buying all the way in. I mean, come on. Let's just, let's just be real here and understand that people are going to transfer and you know this this the the just how many games this team is going to end up winning it's not worth losing sleep over stuff like this so maybe they'll return to the team we'll see um but as of now they're out of the team due to personal reasons i wanted to touch on the depth chart that was released i'm looking at uh brad denny um from az family also does the speak of the devils podcast great asu podcast uh just looking at uh, the ASU depth chart on his uh, Twitter page. Um, Omar Norman Lott is still listed as out, and he's probably the best defensive lineman on the team, or at least the one with the most uh, potential talent. Obviously, he big, big four-star recruit when ASU got him, and it was really the only – I mean, he entered – if you guys remember, he entered his name into the transfer portal or considered doing it um, and then returned a few days later, so – interesting that he decided to come back um and i bet he'll want to get back on the field later this season but so far he is listed as out um but roe torrance who missed last week uh you know big cornerback that we have i think got a little injured against oklahoma state he is listed as being back in so you get some help in the secondary with the return of torrance um and yeah, you know, not too many changes to the depth chart. I actually think ASU has been fairly healthy. We're talking about, you know, a handful of guys each week. And, you know, for this team, they came in with not having their full allotment of scholarship players, very thin at like the linebacker wide receiver rooms. And so far, Sowellie and Merlin are still playing. Um, a lot of the top wide receivers are still playing. So they, they haven't been totally screwed by the injury bug yet, and maybe that's kind of something that uh, could go two ways. Either maybe they kind of maintain this type of injury luck, and maybe that could help them snipe off some teams um, down the road that get hit by injuries uh, on their schedule. You never know how it's going to work out, especially if it's a quarterback injury and the backup is just completely inexperienced. We see that all the time in college football. In fact, if Emory Jones <laughs> – got injured I think we would uh, experience that fate and you think the team doesn't look good now um air isn't playing to its potential right now uh if Emory Jones goes out and it's probably not better but could be totally wrong about that maybe Borgay shines or Paul Tyson shows us something but anyway um it, my bit larger point is that maybe ASU has injury luck throughout the entire season or maybe it's just eventually it's going to catch up to them and 
in the next few weeks, they just get pounded with injuries and the season um, even goes off the, goes off the cliff even more <laughs> uh, if that can, if that can happen. So uh, looking pretty healthy entering the UC that, that not the UCLA game entering the USC game. Uh, no Omar Norman lot will play, but we, you know, again, we'll just, I'm going into this game with no expectations I hope there's competitiveness and I hope there's fight through the entire game, which there was against Utah. I will give it a guano this, like the team did not quit. Um, they didn't, you know, obviously didn't play super well, but they did not quit. And with where this team is right now, that's kind of a lot. I don't want to say that's all you can ask for, but that's a good sign of sorts, you know, um, Obviously, it, it may not even change. <laughs> Honestly, the the difference between them quitting and not quitting is just how much they lose by at this point, you know, uh, in in regards to these next two games. I think them actually, like, buying in and continue to um, want to improve and stuff, I think that will help them, especially when they're playing teams like uh, like a Stanford coming up. Um, that's – Stanford's had a bad start to the season too. So if you can at least continue to try and continue to keep – trying to improve as the season goes on and not throw in the towel, you might be able to beat a Stanford. Maybe you can pick off a UCLA. Uh, who knows? Um, and in Colorado, you might not even have to try and still beat them. So uh, at least at least we have Colorado. Um, Colorado, which actually has not fired Carl Dorrell yet. And I bring that up because another school in the Power Five has made a coaching um, firing. That would be Georgia Tech over the weekend. They fired Jeff, uh, fired head coach Jeff Collins. Uh, and they also fired their athletic director, Todd Stansberry. What a concept. You actually fired that athletic director as well. I wish Michael Crow could have seen what they'd done at Georgia Tech. It was pretty innovative over there. Um, yeah, they, they went a little further than ASU did, I guess, but Anyway, when it comes just specifically to coaching, not going to go too far down the athletic director change rabbit hole that many ASU fans desire. I would, maybe not many, most ASU fans desire. Um, anyway, we have another coaching job that's on the market, uh, joining ASU Nebraska and it, joining ASU Nebraska. So, um, this is a diff. This is kind of an interesting job, uh, Georgia Tech, because. You, it's kind of weird because they have like these boring uniforms and they played the the option for so long with Paul Johnson during the 2000s and a lot of the 2010s uh, tried to switch over to a more modernized game with Jeff Collins obviously didn't work because he got fired uh, three games into this or four games into the season. So, um, but there are some, but you know, Georgia Tech is in Atlanta, which is maybe the best place to be in terms of geographic, like the best geographic place to be in terms of recruiting. The problem is that makes Georgia Tech tough is that it has a very high, like it's tough to get kids in. Um, and there's not a lot of, I'm, I'm kind of just repeating stuff I've heard, like cover three podcast. They were talking about this. Uh, there's not a lot of like easy majors to get kids into. Whereas at ASU, you have so many of those at Nebraska. I'm sure you have many of those too. And uh, Auburn eventually when they, that job comes open, but uh, Georgia tech, very engineering school. Um, I mean, I probably wouldn't have been able to do a lot, a lot of those stuff. Uh, a lot of the uh, degrees there. Um, and so and then, and that's not even like a football player thing. That's like a, just anyone going into the school. Like it's just a really tough school. Uh, they're basically saying you don't recruit against Georgia and Alabama and Auburn. If you're at Georgia tech, you recruit against Northwestern and Vanderbilt and Stanford and Duke. And it's like, I think it's much more along that type of job than ASU. And I know Deion Sanders has been thrown out as the Georgia tech head coach uh, obviously Atlanta ties, but is this, is Georgia tech the job you would go after? You know, it's like, I don't know that that just doesn't seem, maybe this is just my ASU fandom speaking here, but it, I could envision it much more easier to at ASU 
than Georgia Tech because it's just going to be easier to get you if you can have less restrictions of getting kids into the school, then it'll be easier to bring more talented kids into the school because not everyone's going to be able to, you know, work on engineering courses while playing a college football season. It's just going to be very difficult. And there are very few kids that can actually be good at both. Uh, so to speak, it's just a, they're both, it's just extremely hard to be a good college football player and extremely hard to get through high level college math courses and stuff. So um, that's why all these academic schools that just have challenges um, competing at big time football, you know, uh, Stanford did it for a little bit, but didn't sustain. And that's why, that's why, like, my whole point of this is ASU is a better job than Georgia Tech. And so um, if you hear names getting thrown out, if you're a coach, yes, Atlanta is a better recruiting area, but would you have, would you want to deal with keeping kids in school? Would you want to deal with finding the right majors for some of these kids? Would you want to deal with just more rigorous course loads for the entirety of your roster instead of a place like ASU. Yeah. You may have some, a few kids doing stuff like that, <coughs> but there are a lot of easier degrees that you can get uh, kids into school doing obviously helps easier transfer portal destination for ASU JUCO uh, more options there. And so I, I think a lot of, coaches I think there's just less hassles at ASU than there might be for Georgia Tech even though Georgia Tech is in a better recruiting location um and maybe maybe some the next coach comes in there and does a better job than the next coach at ASU that's very possible so um sometimes having restrictions like that makes you focus even more which is something ASU hasn't really done I think ASU has kind of gone by with Oh, we can we can always get kids in, and there's always going to be enough kids that want to come here, and that's kind of somewhat been true in terms of having a high floor as a team. Um, you know, in my time watching ASU football, it's been about eight years. Uh, I've seen one losing regular season, and that was I want to say 2016 with Todd Graham. Uh, they went five and seven, but there hasn't been too many like totally disaster seasons from ASU this, this year might be one, but if they can go like four and eight, that's not like, that's definitely a swoon for sure. But um, it's not like, it's nothing like going one and 11 or zero and 12 or whatever. Some, some things that happens in other schools. So ASU having a high floor um, oftentimes has, uh, lulled them into you know security of not having to hire the best coach of not having to hire the most innovative coach um and i think as something that we mentioned last episode it, excuse me asu needs to really focus in on this coaching search and they really need to hire offensive mind young up, up and coming offensive mind um who can rejuvenate the program and get the recruiting going. So there's a lot more coaching search material to be discussed, but, you know, there's only so much that's happening. Um, it, it, I will be honest. It is tough to get super, super, super dialed into a losing team after they just got blown out by a good team and they're going on the road to play another good team. You just kind of feel like, you know, it's going to happen. Um, wish this game wasn't at night. It's going to be a late kickoff. You're kind of, you're not going to be, at least for me, I'm not going to be like waiting all day. Like, Oh, this, I wonder what's going to happen, but it's like, Oh, what's I'm more like waiting all day. I'm like, Oh, what's going to happen? Like just, I don't know. I'm just not, I, I just hope we don't get blown out uh, super duper bad. You know, like, like I said, uh, I'm hoping for a similar type of effort and fight as they did in Oklahoma state uh, to repeat itself against USC uh, to some measure. So we got one more, one more job open. Um, so the coaching search, I, I, I recommend um, on Twitter, if you, see you know national college football talking heads kind of talking about 
<clears throat> talking about the Nebraska job and the ASU job, Georgia Tech job, it's it's interesting to hear what they have to say, and, and they have connections, obviously. Um, but it's interesting to hear what they have to say, uh, talking talking with coaches, uh, talking with administrators, and all these little things that each school has to offer and their weaknesses as well. It's just it's very interesting, and, and um, you know, college football is very subjective, and which which football job is the best is better is also very subjective and it's kind of fun to listen to. So we have a lot more of that. I think pretty much every, not every ASU fan, but most ASU fans, uh, their main, main uh, source of curiosity and interest is more dedicated to the coaching search. And for me, that's definitely how it is. So again, we'll have to see how it all shakes out. Uh, if any surprise names come open, um, but until then, let's hope the Devils, uh, you know, show a better performance against USC and maybe turn their season around um, into more respectability moving forward. You know, I'm not not hoping for a bowl. I mean, I'm hoping for a bowl game, not expecting a bowl game, but just don't stick out as being like, let me put it this way. The, the goal for the rest of the season should be be considerably better than Colorado. <laughs> And luckily they could they get to play, but don't be like kind of better than Colorado, be considerably better. Um, that's where we're at. So anyway, not expecting ASU to win this weekend. Um, hopefully the ground game gets going a little more. USC will probably give you some opportunities to do that, but they'll probably torch you on the other end too. So uh score prediction, I'll say 45 to 23 UCLA. Oh my gosh, UCLA, USC. Hey, I got I got the two schools mixed up. They're they soon won't be in our conference anyway, so they don't deserve my respect. All right, uh, that has been a hastily made episode thirteen of Stomp the Bus. Thanks for checking it out, and go Devils.